And that's why we're here today. You know, it's just amazing. It's just marvelous. It's wonderful. You, you think, why would God choose me, use me, show his love for me? It, it's an amazing thought. I, the thing I love about Easter is the thought that today, literally hundreds of millions of people all around this little earth, hundreds of millions of people are all worshiping Jesus Christ for rising from the grave. Isn't that an amazing thought? It's just such a cool thought that we're joining these hundreds of millions of people on this planet and we're all worshiping him for the same thing. But I was, I was thinking about that, though, for, for all those hundreds of millions that, are, that would come to Easter service and worship him, the truth is, is for most of those people, the resurrection doesn't affect their everyday life. It's an Easter thing, you know, where, yeah, I'll come to church on Easter, sing a few songs, but really, day to day, the resurrection means nothing to them. But there are some people on this planet whom it's the exact opposite, where the resurrection of Jesus Christ actually affects every major decision they make in life is based upon this one fact that Jesus Christ rose from the grave. And so it changes every day. It changes everything about their lives. And I guess my question today is, where are you on that scale? Where the resurrection of Jesus affects everything you do, or would you say it really doesn't affect anything that I do? In fact, let me ask a question maybe a better way. Well, first let me ask this. How many of you would say you believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ? Okay. I know, that's a lot of peer pressure, so you're just like, <laughs> not really, but I don't want to look like, a, I don't wanna look like Satan here, Okay. <laughs> Now, so, so everyone's kind of saying, okay, hey, we believe in the resurrection. Um, here's, here's my question. If you didn't believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ, how would you live life differently? Okay, just think right now. What would you do differently in life if you didn't believe in the resurrection of Jesus? If you have to think too hard to come up with something, you gotta ask yourself if you really believe this thing. You know, it was, it was great when we were here on Good Friday. Todd gave this message about the cross. It, it was one of the most powerful messages I've heard on the cross where he just talked about how if we really believe this thing, gosh, when we take of communion, there should be this militant, you know, like we won mentality, like all of my sin, all that garbage is just wiped away by the cross. It was put to death and, and there should be this excitement of, man, that's right, nothing can tear me apart from God now. All of my crimes, everything, all those barriers are gone and, and we're united forever and there should be this joy, this excitement. And as I was listening to that, I'm like, man, he's so right. In the same way with the resurrection, I mean, if I really believe that he rose from the grave, that should change everything in life. It should impact every area of my life. It, it, there was this, this person in the Bible, his name was Saul. And Saul lived a very comfortable life. Everything was going well for him, pretty high position. In fact, he was out persecuting Christians. I, I mean, that was back in the, the early day, right when the church was getting started. And, and he was a very powerful, prominent, comfortable, doing well type of guy. And then he started believing in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And it changed everything about him. It changed his life completely completely to the point where he went from persecuting people to becoming the most persecuted Christian on this planet. And after being tortured so often, after sacrificing so much, he writes this in 1 Corinthians 15. He says, if only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are to be pitied more than all men. He, he says, he goes, you, you think I'm doing this for fun? He goes, do you think I'm out here being tortured? For he goes, if there's no life after death, if there's no life after this one, then I'm the stupidest person on this planet. I, you should pity me more than anyone else on this earth because everything has turned around in my life. I had it all and I gave it all up because I believed in the resurrection of Jesus. He says, I put everything in this. If I am wrong, 
then I just wasted my whole life. See, that's the way our lives ought to look if we believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Paul also says later in verse 32, he says, if the dead are not raised, let's eat and drink for tomorrow we die. He goes, that's a great way to live life if there's no life after death. Okay, if, if everything is just about what you see on this planet, then the smartest thing for you to do is just go out and enjoy yourself, have the greatest amount of pleasure possible. Don't worry about hurting other people. Don't worry about anything else. Just enjoy yourself because you're just gonna die and this is all meaningless anyways. But Paul says, because I believe in the resurrection of the dead, because I believe Jesus rose again, that means I'm gonna rise from the grave. My life is completely, completely, completely different. How many of you have heard of a guy named Jack Bauer? <laughs> okay, a lot of you. CTU agent, counterterrorist unit. Um, he, uh, he's really saved our country many times. And um, it, it, this may help you if, if you see him. Okay. Now, a lot of things he does, okay, they're, they're top secret. So that's why maybe a lot of you don't know, okay? <laughs> It's just confidential stuff, classified stuff, but okay, it's, it's, the, it's, it's from the TV show 24, and uh, someone gave us, a, they let us borrow season four of the show, and go, oh, you gotta watch this. So you start watching the show, you know, about this guy, Jack, and how he's just saving the world, saving America over and over. I didn't know we were in that much trouble, but man, I'm just so glad he lives here. But, but I'm watching season four, right? You know, and a lot of you guys are watching season five, but I, I'm watching season four, and, 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 and there was this one scene where, where these terrorists, they uh, kidnap our secretary of defense and, and his daughter, and, uh, and Jack finally finds their location right as they're about to execute. They're about to kill our Secretary of Defense on live television. And Jack goes, I found the location. He calls in CTU, asks for backup. But backup isn't coming for 20 minutes. He goes, that's too late. I'm going in alone. And I'm going, no way, Jack, don't do it. You don't get it. There's like 50 terrorists in there. You can't go by yourself. But he goes. He's going. He's going to save our country. He's going to save the Secretary of Defense. And he goes in. He's taking people out. And I'm going, you know, your heart starts pounding. Then I go, wait a second. This is season four. Season five's coming. He's still alive there. <laughs> in fact, in fact, he just signed a contract for three more seasons. So those of you guys that are watching now, guess what? He doesn't die. He's got six, seven, and eight coming. And so every time, you know, we, we start watching these episodes, you know, when it got intense, I would just back off and go, okay, he doesn't really die. And, and the truth is, is you guys, that's, that's what the resurrection of Jesus Christ does for me. See, I get into life just like you do. And things happen to me, and I get all intense. The difference is I back off every once I go, wait a second doesn't matter because I don't really die in the end. No matter what happens in this life, it really doesn't matter. I just back off and go, you know what? Any moment now, I'm going to be in heaven with God forever for season five, six, eight billion, <laughs> you know, 29 trillion, on and on and on and on. And it's not it's just the best feeling. It's like, gosh, whatever happens, I can just step back and go, wait, I know how this thing ends. And I know the way it's going to be forever. And, and so suddenly life just has this whole different look to it. See, the resurrection of Jesus Christ should change the way you view everything on this earth. It's the greatest way to live. In fact, Paul, when he talks about uh, our bodies here on earth, he says in, in verse 36 of that same chapter, 1 Corinthians 15, he, he compares our lives, our bodies, to a seed. He says it's like this. He goes, what you sow does not come to life unless it dies. When you sow, you don't plant the body that will be, but just a seed, perhaps of wheat or something else. He says, it's a lot like when you have a seed. What do you want that seed to do? You want to stick it in the ground. What do you want to happen to that seed? You want that seed to die so that something else will spring up, the true life, the true plant. He, and he's explained that in the same way, when we die, it's, it's the same thing. You want to die. You want your body to go down into that ground and just kind of disintegrate because it's going to rise up into something else. 
And when you have that knowledge, you know, which Jesus gave to us by his resurrecting, by his coming back to life and showing us, look, there's life after death, and that's the real life. It's like, wow, suddenly I look at my body, I look at my life, I go, I'm just a seed. That's all there is to it, and actually, this body doesn't really matter a whole lot. In fact, it goes on, and he says this. He says, so it will be with the resurrection of the dead. The body that is sown is perishable, but it's raised imperishable. That's pretty cool. It's sown in dishonor, it's raised in glory. It's sown in weakness, but we get raised in power. It's sown, it's thrown into the ground as this natural body, but it gets raised as a spiritual body. And if there's a natural body, there's a spiritual body. It's this beautiful picture saying, look, right now we're in these bodies that absolutely are just incredibly made. I mean, when you start studying the human body and every little function there is to every cell in your body, you're just amazed. But what God says is, yeah, but that's a perishable body. That's, that's just this little thing that I made that's like a seed. You're gonna drop it into the ground, all of you. It's gonna go six feet under, it's, it's done, and it's gonna die, and then something else is gonna spring up. This is the real life. That's what the resurrection gave us the hope for. And, and I tell you, when you start looking at life that way, it, it impacts everything, from the huge decisions in life to the little decisions in life. It was funny, even this week on, on Wednesday, I, I was out surfing and, and somehow, you know, when I fell, the board hit my leg and I cut my leg open. It's like, oh, great, you know, it's, it's got this little gash. It's another scar. I've got so many scars on my legs. And then I thought, who cares? It's a seed, you know? It's going to be thrown in the dirt. I mean, I, how many more years am I going to be in this thing? It just really doesn't matter. Your, your outlook on life, suddenly it's like it's not all about this body. You know, I got to keep it all perfect. There are no wrinkles. I try not to smile too much and <laughs> not go in the sun, you know, and everything else. It's like, come on, it's a seed. It's going to be here a little bit, and, you know, but it's this perishable body. It's going to be raised and perishable. And it's like, gosh, to look forward to that and know how it all ends and know the types of beings we're going to be at the end, that's, that's what matters. In fact, uh, later in, in verse 55, Paul makes a statement. He says about death, he goes, where, O oh death, is your victory? Where, O oh death, is your sting? It, it, it's like he's mocking death. He's saying, you know, Jesus died. He rose again. So what's so scary about dying? He goes, he took that sting away. And he explains how the, the sting of, of death was sin. You know, it, death would have been a scary thing if we died and knew, oh, now I'm going to be judged by God. You know, and God's going to punish me for everything I did wrong. But the Bible explains that that's what Jesus was dying for. He died on the cross for that. He paid for my penalty. You know, for those of us who believe in him, I can come to him at the end of my life and go, Jesus, I know I, I did so many horrible things during my lifetime, but, but your son Jesus died for those and knowing that I can do that, it's like the sting of death, the fear. It's, it's this picture of a scorpion or a bee that has its stinger removed. I mean, bees are, are kind of scary things, right? But what if you knew it had no stinger? It's like, oh, a little fuzzy yellow thing, you know? <laughs> and, and really, it's like it's suddenly the whole, the whole horror of death is completely gone. It's like, big deal. So my body goes into the ground and I get raised in a, a better body? an imperishable body that's raised with power, with glory. I, I look forward to that, and, and suddenly death, it's lost its power. It's lost its sting, all because one man rose from the grave. You guys, this is not about something we sing about once a year, or we attend church for once a year. It's about something that affects every single thing in our lives. It should impact all of our decisions it should bring so much life and so much joy and so much security and peace to go, well, I know how it ends. So yeah, there'll be some tough episodes here on earth that I'll go through, but I know everything's gonna be fine in the end. And man, how that, how that changes life. And this is the part of the message where, you know, I, I sit here and I think about how good it is to know God, how wonderful it is that I believe in the resurrection, and, and then I just want to beg everyone else to do the same, you know, and say, oh, you got to believe this thing. And I, I know a lot of you guys are visiting. I know there's, there's people here who don't believe in God, and I get tempted here to argue with you 
and say, you want to debate about something? Let me, let me give you some facts. Let's, let's talk history. Let's talk prophecy. Let's talk archaeology. Let's just talk about these different holy books out there and, and just start comparing this and that. And, but it's interesting because when Jesus spoke, okay, when Jesus spoke when he was on this earth, he used a phrase that no one else in Scripture uses. He uses this phrase. After he'd give a message, he'd say, he who has ears... Let him hear. He says that all the time. No one else says it in Scripture, just Jesus. He who has ears, let him hear. A very important phrase because he would give a message and then he wouldn't try to argue with anyone. He goes, if you got ears to hear it, you'll hear it. If you don't, you won't. In fact, sometimes he'd give a message that was hard to understand and use parables and because he says, you know what, if you really want to understand it, you'll get it. Then he didn't argue. And, and, and that's so contrary to me because I always want to argue because people say, well, I don't believe in Jesus because I watch the Da Vinci Code. <laughs> I'm like, all right, you want to argue Da Vinci Code? We'll argue Da Vinci Code. You know, and, and, we're, and I'll do that. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about it in a couple of weeks and destroy the thing. You know, but, <laughs> but here's the thing. Here's the deal. It's, 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 it's such a joke. It doesn't even need to be destroyed. But, you know, here's the thing. If, if that's your, but, but here's, if, if that's your argument, let me ask you a question, though. If I can prove to you that the Da Vinci Code is such an absolute joke, then will you believe in Jesus? No, because you'll move on to the Gospel of Judas, right? Yeah. And, but, but how about if I explain that away, too? Then will you believe in Jesus? No, you'll find something else. You say, well, it's because there's all these hypocrites, you know, that, that I... Okay, so if we got rid of all the hypocrites in the church... Okay, and you were here by yourself, you know, it, you, you just, uh, then are you going to believe? You know, you see, Jesus' point was, I'm not going to argue everything on this earth. Are you telling me you're going to believe once I can debunk every single other teaching there is on this planet? Because a new one's going to rise about every 25 minutes. And you want to keep arguing, 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 arguing. Is that really the issue? Or is the truth that you don't want to believe in Jesus. And so no matter what argument is thrown your way, you're going to try some way to twist it, pull it away, say, no, it means something else. What about this fact here? What about when you'll jump to another thing, another thing, another thing? And so Jesus just says, you know what? Here's the truth. Let me just lay it out. He who has ears, let him hear. I'm not going to argue about it. I thought, wow, because he was talking about the condition of the human heart. If you don't want to believe in God, you won't, regardless of what anyone throws at you, right? And so let me just lay it out. It's what the Apostle Paul did. Again, that same chapter, 1 Corinthians 15, in verse 3. I love the way he says it. He just puts it so simply. He goes, what I received, I pass on to you as of first importance. That Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. That he was buried and that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. That's it. That's his whole message. He, here, here it is. He goes, it's just that Christ died for your sins. Just like the scriptures say. And then he was buried and then he rose again on the third day. That's what happened. Jesus died for you. Do you know that? He did. I'm not going to convince you of it. I'm just telling you. He did. He was buried. It happened. Joseph took the body, put it in a tomb. And then that body was raised. And he walked again and he appeared to over 500 people. He just started talking to different people. And these people, their lives were changed completely. And they went out and started telling everyone, I, I can't believe what I just saw. That's what happened. Christ died for your sins. What does that mean? That means that you have done some things that deserve punishment. You've done some things during your lifetime that deserve the wrath of God. God should punish you for those things. But Christ died for you. Christ took that punishment for you on the cross. That's what Todd was talking about on Good Friday, about how, how Jesus, it was nailed to the cross. All the sin, all the punishment, Jesus paid for it so that you wouldn't have to if you would believe in him. That's what happened. And this whole idea of you being guilty before God, I know it flies in the face of everything else you're taught in this world today because some people are trying to tell you, no, 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 you're a good person. You're a really good person. You're, you're inherently good. In fact, we're all pretty good people. By nature, we're just generally good. You know, yeah, there's a few evil people. You know, there's the Hitlers, the Bin Ladens, Paris Hilton. You know, it's just, you know, they're, they're like more the wicked type. But then, you know, everyone else, we're pretty good. I'm kidding about Paris. She's 
probably very nice. Um, but, uh, you know, it's, it's just... It's interesting, though, because if you ask the average person in America, do you think you're going to heaven? What would they say? Yeah. Or I think so. Usually it's more, I I think so. They usually kind of go, I think so. It's just like that. (laughs) Then you go, why? They go, because I think I'm a pretty good person. Right? Like that. Because I think I'm a pretty good person. You know, it's just, that's just it's the answer, right? You think I'm going to heaven? I mean, you think you're going to heaven? Yeah, I think so. Why? Because I think I'm a pretty good person. Okay, that's, that's the answer. The thing is, is I think so. You're going to risk, we're talking heaven or hell, on an I think so. On a pretty good person. You sure you're good enough? I think so. Eternity, eternity, heaven, hell, forever. Probably. I just go, man, how can you live like that? Okay, here here, here we go, here we go. I I need five volunteers, okay? All right, just just five people. You you wanna go, anyone. You don't have to say anything, you just come up and stand. Sure, as long as you don't mind being on TV, all over the internet. Okay, all right, good, good. Now people are rushing. Oh, perfect, perfect. Okay, I got, I got, my, I got my, my, uh, my one, two, three, four, five. Perfect, perfect. Here are five people, and uh, I, got, I got my ushers. They're going to come and they're going to put some signs up, okay? Now, these people up here on the stage are going to represent some different people. Um, over here on this side, you have the ultimate evil and the ultimate good, okay? Now, here, here let's think. Who, who do you think of when you think of ultimate good, like the best person in the world? I'll, I'll let you be that person. Who do, you think, who do you think of when you think of who is the, just the best, most wholesome person on this planet? Billy Graham, Mother Teresa, okay. She'll be uh, Mother Graham. She'll be a... Uh, She'll be, we'll, we'll make her Billy Graham, Billy Graham, okay? Here's Billy Graham, just good, clean. You know, he knows he's not perfectly good, the ultimate good. He has some things in his life. He's got some issues. But here's, here's Billy Graham, pretty good. Now, who do you think of when you think of the most evil person you could think of? Hitler? Okay, Hitler. You want to be Hitler? You got a little... Okay. Stalin? Okay, here, you, you be Hitler. You stand over here. I must ask for Hitler. Yeah, yeah. Well, we'll save the rest. Then we got to raise it. Okay. Here's here's Hitler, and there's Billy Graham. Okay. Now just name anyone. Who do you want her to be? Michael Jackson. What? Who? <laughs> Michael Jackson. Fine. You be Michael Jackson. Okay. Now, you guys point me. Which way does Michael Jackson start moving this way? Oh, how far? Keep going. Keep going. Tell me when to stop. Right here. Right here. Here. Close, or, okay, right here, right here, right here. Okay, I see, and most people are telling us to stop. Okay, Michael. Hey, all right. Okay, who do you want her to be? Who's that? Who? Hillary Clinton. Oh, okay, that's a good one. Okay, start pointing. Which way do you want to go? Wow, no one's pointing. Whoa, come on, Hillary. Hillary, worse than Michael. Worse than Mike. Okay, right here. Right here. Okay, okay. There's Hillary Clinton. Okay, who's this? Who do we? Oprah. Oprah, good. Okay. Where's Oprah go? Just start pointing. Oh, we got. Wait, wait. Which way? Everyone's got. Uh, this way? <laughs> wow, this feels like Jerry Springer now. Okay, which way? Which... Okay. You guys can't make up your mind, so we'll just leave Oprah right here. Is that good? Okay, how many people think she should be further that way? How many think Oprah should go further this way? Man, that's right in the middle. That's split. Okay. Okay, so here's Oprah. There's Billy Graham. There's uh, Michael Jackson. And who was it? Hillary Clinton. Hillary Clinton. <laughs> and Hitler. Okay, that's great. That's great. Hillary Clinton, Hitler. Wow, that's really funny. Now, the question is, on this scale of good to evil, where would you put yourself? Okay, would you put yourself here? A little bit here? I mean, just, just based on your own works. Your own works. 
Right? You, think, you guys think you're better? How many people think they're better than Oprah? <laughs> Just by their word. How many people feel like they're worse than Oprah? Wow, she's like the middle, just, just perfect. Okay, then here's, here's the question. Okay, where, where should this sign go? The side, wait, which side of Oprah? The side of Oprah? The side of Oprah? Do you know what she does for all the starving kids in Africa? Okay. All right, you, you, guys, you guys can have a seat. Thank you. They, thank our volunteers. Okay. See, what I love about that is everyone's got this opinion here of where everyone should go, right? And the judgment should go. And then everyone on earth would, would talk about where the sign should go and what side they should be on. And yet what the, the Bible says is this sign's way over here. According to the scriptures, the Bible says that everyone, okay, it's not like there's this cutoff line that's right here on this side of Oprah or on the other side of Oprah. The Bible doesn't say that there's this line, and this is this myth that everyone wants to believe, that that sign is, is, is over there, and I'm on this side or that side, or I'm not sure, or I think so. And the Bible makes it so clear. He goes, no, you, you got to understand, everyone on earth has sinned against me. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Everyone. God says, you guys think this person's a little better than that person. There's someone, he goes, I'm looking at the earth, and I'm seeing everyone has offended me. Everyone's broken my law. There aren't good people on this planet. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And that's why we study, we'd say in that verse, it says, but Christ, Paul says, look, I'm just passing on what I heard, what I saw that Christ died for your sins. He died for all of these people's sins, from Billy Graham all the way to Hitler. So you know, I died for all of them. That's what I nailed to the cross. And the Bible says, if you will confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved, and you'll be standing right here under this sign. At the end of your life, you're gonna be here because the Bible says that you switched places with Jesus. When Jesus was on the cross, he took on our sin. He became sin. He who knew no sin, he who was ultimate good, became the ultimate evil, nailed to that cross so that we, in turn, could take his place and be the ultimate good, be the, be the children of God. And when he rose from the grave, he explained, look, this is the power. This is who I am. And, and you know what I, I love about this? Um, you know, I'm not going to try to, again, try to convince you of this. I'm just telling you the way it is, that you are a sinner, and Christ did die for you. And if you choose to believe that, you can have eternal life. And the Bible also says that, that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures. Because he rose from the grave, he proved to everyone there, look, my words mean something. Suddenly, I stand alone as being the only person on this planet who said he would die and rise again. Then I did it. And I'm telling you, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. You're all sinners, and that's why I came, to die for you, to pay for your sins, because I love you so much. Now, one thing I want to point out before I finish up here is uh, something that, that was uh, revealed to me this week. Someone showed me. In Mark 16, it's interesting. When it talks about the resurrection of Jesus, like the, the women go to the tomb to find Jesus, but Jesus isn't there, right? And the stones rolled away, and they see an angel. And what does the angel tell them to do? You know, he, he explains to them, look, you're looking for Jesus. Jesus rose just like he said he would. But then he tells these girls, he goes, hey, go and tell the disciples and Peter. That's an interesting phrase. Go tell the Peter was one of the disciples, what do you mean the disciples and Peter? But if you look, why would, he, why would he single out Peter? Oh, I love this. Oh, I so love this. Why do you single out Peter? Because if you remember the story, just, just a few chapters before that, Peter, you know, was telling Jesus, Jesus, you know what? I love you. I'm crazy about you. Jesus goes, you know what, Peter? You're going to end up denying me. And Peter goes, give me a break. He goes, I would never deny you. I would never deny knowing you. I will die with you. That's what Peter says. And Jesus goes, no way. He goes, before the rooster crows, you're going to deny me three times. And Peter goes, forget that. 
I am going to die with you. I will never deny you. And then shortly after, Jesus gets arrested and they start torturing him. And someone comes to Peter and goes, hey, aren't you one of his guys? I don't know him. See, Peter knew if, they, if they're doing that to Jesus, what are they going to do to me? And suddenly someone else comes to him and goes, wait, weren't you with Jesus? And Peter goes, I didn't know the guy. Then another person comes up to Jesus and comes up to Peter and goes, wait, aren't you one of Jesus' disciples? He goes, I'm telling you, I don't know the man. And then suddenly a rooster crows. And then one of the gospels says that Jesus at that moment turns and looks right at Peter. Like, what did I tell you? And Peter just runs off and just starts bawling. Jesus is crucified. Imagine, who do you think felt the worst by this point? Peter, who said, I will die with you, suddenly can't be found. He's running away, you know, knowing what was happening to Christ. He got so scared, and, and, and he probably was just out there disappointed, probably didn't even want to be counted as one of the disciples. And then Christ rises from the dead and says, go get the disciples and Peter. Peter probably thinks, I don't want to have anything to do with him because he made all these promises and he so walked away from it. He so messed up his life. He so betrayed me. So go tell Peter I still want him. Tell the disciples, but especially Peter. And I love that. That's just so beautiful to me. Because the truth is, is, is man, many of us have had those times in our life, especially those who come on Easter Many of the people that come to Easter are the people that maybe grew up in church, had some sort of church upbringing. And maybe when you were in high school, or maybe when you were in junior high, maybe when you were a kid, you said, I will follow Jesus. I'll die for him. I'm going to live a pure life. I'm going to have this great family. We're going to serve God together. And your life didn't go that direction, did it? Maybe you made some commitment at some camp or at some church or some Easter service where you said, no, we're going to keep this family together or, or, or I'm, I'm never going to look at pornography again and you're addicted again. I'm never going to touch alcohol again and then, and then you're, you're an alcoholic. You, you, you just went right back to that old way of life that you promised you would not go back to and you told God, God, I will follow you. I'm going to serve you. I'll give you my life. And then you did the exact opposite. And you walk into a church and you feel the shame. You feel like it's one thing, you know, if I never believed in Jesus, but I kind of believed at one point and then totally ditched the whole thing. And you just feel like, gosh, where did I go wrong? And I, and I love the fact that the resurrected Christ is saying to you today, hey, tell everyone else, but tell her specifically. I still want her. I'm going after Peter. It's just an awesome thought that God in heaven right now is going after you and that's why you're in this room. And that's why I'm saying these words. I'm telling you, there was a, t maybe it just is so dear to me because about 15 years ago, I just thought, I'm through. I am the biggest loser. I knew better. I knew what it meant to walk with Jesus and I walked away. And I just became this hypocrite everything else and just thought he's done with me and then God for some reason you know maybe that's why that song choked me up so much it's like why would he pick me after everything I've done after knowing better and he still goes after me and wants to use me that's an amazing thought but that's a story of the resurrected Christ he's saying I'm going after you and he uses Peter to change the world and to think that I can be a small part of that now. And that he's saying that to each of us in this room. I, I know what you've done. He, he's the only one in this room that knows your past. And he goes, but I'm telling you today, I still want you. And the spirit that raised Christ from the dead, he'll come into you and change your life, help you become who you want to be. Become the person God wants you to be. See, some of you are sitting here and you're looking at your life and you're going, man, this isn't who I pictured myself being at this stage in life. I'm saying God can change all of that. You'd be amazed. Some of the people in this room, you know, may, you may look at their lives and go, man, I wish I had a family like theirs. But they're in your shoes not that long ago. It's just feeling hopeless, feeling like an absolute mess, feeling like what is the point of my life? And now because of the resurrected Christ, it affects every decision they make. And they have so much joy, so much peace, all because of Jesus. 
you know, I, I'm gonna do something different, and this is, this is really just for this service because it's only gonna happen once. Um, but uh, I, I uh, kind of planned this out just about two hours ago for this service. Um, one of our staff people, I, I, need to, uh, I need to have him help me out here, Eddie Ray. It, where is Eddie? Eddie, if you'll come up here. Um, Eddie, Eddie works with our college ministry, and he could make it to this service, so I asked him to come to this service. And um, here you go. Just do what you need to do. All right. How's everyone doing? Good. You guys, I was on that side. I was on that side for a very long time, and Jesus Christ has given me a new life. It's not a perfect life. It's not the life of Donald Trump, which I don't want anyways now, but there is nothing perfect about life until we're in heaven with him. But while we're here, we do have some decisions that need to be made. Why procrastinate on some of these decisions? Dominique French, would you please come up here? This is my girlfriend. <laughs> I've been dating her for a while. Come, come this way. Come on. Isn't she pretty? <laughs> come here, babe. Come on. Been dating her for about seven months. Francis is right, two hours ago. We put this together. Uh, what did we put together? Something really cool. Dominique French, I love you. I would like to know if you'd wear this ring and be my wife. Thank you. It's nice. Congratulations. <laughs> so cool. We've never had an engagement at Cornerstone. Now, here's the thing. Because he was telling me he was going to engage. I'm like, dude, will you do it in front of everyone? <laughs> because to me, I go, that's the perfect picture of this relationship with Jesus. Man, don't you understand? It's God in heaven. What this is all about is it's about God in heaven getting down on one knee before you and saying, will you begin a relationship with me? Will you take me? He's saying, man, I had my own son pay for your sins. He died for you. And I'm saying, because I want you, because I love you, because I want to spend eternity with you. It's like God is on one knee. He's just wanting to hand you this ring and say, will you marry me? Will you enter in this union with me? That's what baptism is all about. Baptism is like this marriage ceremony where you're saying, I'm becoming one with Christ. Just like he died and rose again, I'm going in the water, I'm rising again to a new life. You guys, we're not pushing a religion here. We're talking about the greatest relationship you can have a marriage with God. God even talks about it as a marriage ceremony and talks about when we finally arise and, and, arise and, and, and be with him, when we rise again, that there's gonna be this marriage supper of the lamb, he calls it. It's like the celebration of us finally coming before him like a bride prepared for the groom. And so when I knew he was gonna get engaged today, I thought, you know, that's the perfect example. It's a perfect picture of what God wants with you. And some of you, maybe you made that commitment and you walked away. Maybe you threw that ring away. And I'm saying, you know, God is a God that's saying, you know what, I'll take you back. I'll take you back. I want you back. Like he says to Peter, I'm going after him. Tell the disciples and tell Peter because I want him still. I want to use him still. I want to use her still. You guys, as we worship, we're going to sing. We're going to worship this God because of what he's done for us. But some of you, maybe today, there's a reason why you're here that God wants that relationship with you. Maybe you've never said, I do. Maybe you've been putting it off, putting it off, putting it off. And maybe this Easter is the day you finally come together in this relationship. 
is the day you say I do. It's the day you restore this marriage and this relationship that you once had. And if that's you and you need to pray with someone, I'll be up here by the prayer room. There'll be some other pastors and leaders just to pray with you. If you want to get baptized today, great time to do it. Just to say, you know what? God, I do. I'll, 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 I'll marry you before all these people. I will join you in front of all these people because I'm not ashamed of my relationship with you. And if that's your desire, then just at any time during the worship singing, I'll be up here by the prayer room. Just come up and we'll have you baptized or have someone pray with you. All right.